Oh God, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable unto thee, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. We read the traditional Palm Sunday reading from Zechariah, which of course is recorded in the Gospels. And the lectionary for today is from Philippians 2. Because remember, they came in the name of the Lord, and this is the passage where Paul says there's no other name. So listen to Philippians 2, beginning with verse 1 through 11. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any incentive of love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in a full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfishness or conceit, but in humility count others better than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Have this mind among yourselves which you have in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. May God bless the reading of his holy word. In the Laurel Cemetery in Washington, D.C., in Arlington, there's a monument to the unknown soldier. It's dedicated to those who died and whose bodies they couldn't form, or find, or identify. They were without names, without identity, and therefore they're honored as unknown. Each, each of us has a name. When we're born, there's great excitement as mothers and fathers for nine months are debating, what shall we name our little baby? Sometimes the names are a surprise. Many times the names that carry on a family tradition. Sometimes the names have meanings. Sometimes at baptism a new name is given. This is particularly true in Africa when a person becomes a Christian. They're given a new name when they baptize them. In England, your Christian name is what we call your first name. Last year, our son and daughter-in-law had a little baby boy. And we wondered what they would name him. And my son called and said, we're calling him Boaz. I said, Boaz? Why Boaz, John Paul? He said, because Boaz was a man of integrity. We need men of integrity. I said, well, what's his middle name? And he said, Courage. I said, why Courage? Because we need men of courage. So this little boy will know all his life that his name signifies a man of integrity and courage. Good characteristics and a good reminder for anyone growing up in a manner. All of us have names that identify us, don't you? You go to the doctor's office and you're waiting and waiting and suddenly they call your name and you jump up with hope and finally they remember you. <laughs> at the airport, when you go through TSA, check, they look at your identification, your picture and your name. Dr. Paul Tarnier was a great Swiss counselor and psychologist, a great Christian man. And once a young lady went to him and she wanted to have a, an abortion. They lived in Geneva, Switzerland. And the young lady said, it doesn't matter, it's just a few cells of protoplasm. Dr. Tarnier then asked the young lady, if you were to have this baby, what name would you give to the baby? The young lady was shocked and she suddenly walked out of the doctor's office. You see, giving a name to a baby gives it identity and meaning and a life. What is your name? When you're in love with somebody, you love their name, don't you? You like to hear their name all the time. Think of all the love songs that, that have names in them. Obviously, our names are important to give us identity. 
But in a much more serious way, humankind from the beginning of time was searching for the name of God. The Babylonians built golden calves and called it Baal. And the Greeks had Zeus and all the other religions had tribal gods. But the people to whom God revealed his name were the Hebrew people, the Israelites, and they're in captivity. And God wants to free them from Egyptian oppression, and they suffer long enough. And, and God said, let my people go. And so he called Moses. And Moses said, well, I, 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 who am I going to say? What is your name? What is the name that I can tell them? And God said to Moses, tell them, I am who I am. I am has sent you. What a name, I am. The great God of the Bible is the God who was and is and is to come. He's very life itself. He's very existence itself and therefore he's the great I am. And in Hebrew, the name for, for God is Yahweh, which uh, means in English, we, we change it to mean Jehovah. So for the Moses and the people of Israel, what we mean by, by Yahweh is the great God who is, I am. And he's none other than the most high, the exalted, the mighty one, the majestic one, whom we call God. And God's name throughout history is identified with the people of the Israelites, <clears throat> with the Old Testament, with the Old Covenant. We're so, we, we who live in so-called Christian countries are just accustomed to the fact that there's one God revealed in the Old Testament and the New Testament as the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's only one God. That's monotheism. But many religions aren't like that. There was a, there was a great Hindu leader who went through all of India counting the names of God and finally came up that there were 330 Hindu gods. The God of the Bible has a name. And the God of the Bible is one who acts in history. He calls a people. And through this people, he says, all the nations of the world are going to be blessed. And it's the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and Jacob. When the Hebrews call God's name, uh, they, 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 they substituted the word Lord for Yahweh. They thought that Yahweh was such a holy name, they couldn't even say Yahweh. So they said Lord. Or in Hebrew, they said Adonai. And we say in English, Lord. And that's the Lord of the Bible. The high God, the creator God. It's really necessary to have this understanding of the great I am and who the Hebrew God is when we come to Palm Sunday. Because the, the crowds were, were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who, who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is he who comes in whose name? In the name of the Lord, God Almighty, the Creator God. And we, and we, we hear that all the cities was excited and they were waving their palms and going down. And they said, who is this? Who is this? What's his name? And he said, it's the prophet, Jesus of Nazareth. You get the significance of that confession? Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna. And Hosanna means God save us. Who is this? His name is Jesus. And here we now have the secrets revealed. Jesus began his ministry. Remember all during this Lenten season, they were keeping the name secret. Jesus said, no, don't tell anybody. The people want to understand. They're not ready. But now Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is Lord. He's ready to declare to the nations. He comes in the name of God, and now he's pronounced, you are the Christ. You're the Messiah. You're the anointed one. You're the ones that Isaiah was looking for. You're the ones that Jeremiah was waiting for, that Zechariah and Malachi, all the promises, all the hopes and fears of all the years are met in this Jesus of Nazareth and Hosanna who comes in the name of this Lord, this Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is God taking on flesh and becoming one with us. In the Christmas story, we hear those beautiful words, and his name shall be called Emmanuel, God with us. That's who Jesus is, and that's his name, and that's the name of the Lord that they were cheering about. So to understand Palm Sunday, we need to go back to the prophet Zechariah. The temple had been rebuilt. The people had returned from captivity. They repented of their sins. And now, now Zechariah prophesies that one day, this God who brought you out of Babylonian captivity, he's going to become one with us. And just as he's, you, you walk the streets in Jerusalem, he's going to walk the streets with us. He'd actually become one with us. 
And so this passage in Zechariah is one of the great messianic prophecies of the Old Testament. Because we see in this passage the prophet Zechariah announcing that God is going to become, Emmanuel is going to become one with us. But how? What kind of God? How is he going to come to us? If we were to imagine and create God, how would we have this God come to us? When Queen Elizabeth was, was coronated, she came in a chariot with white horses and all the luxury of the British Empire. When the Pope visited Mexico and, and, and Cuba, he had a Pope mobile. When the U.S. President rides in a parade, he has a luxurious Cadillac. But we read the announcement of God becoming a human being, and what a pray that was. Rejoice greatly, Zechariah says. Rejoice, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you. Triumphant and victorious is he. Humble, riding on an ass. The battle bow will be cut off, and he shall command peace to the nations. His dominion will be from sea to sea. And because of the blood of my covenant with you, he's going to set your captives free. Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. Today I will restore to you double. That's the prophet Zechariah. And the Bible, you know, is so down to earth. It's so real. And the first thing we need to do, says the prophet, is rejoice. Why rejoice? Because your king is coming to you. Your redeemer is coming to you. Isn't that, isn't that what Easter is all about? Joy and rejoicing. Aren't you happy that Christ has died for you? Don't you have joy in your hearts? Rejoice. And who is this king? None other than the Lord God Almighty. And what will he do? He's going to set the captives free. And people are going to return to their homes and their strongholds. And, and they'll be restored. And, and to whom is this addressed? This is for all of humanity, this prophecy. And what are we called? Did you get that? What are we called? Prisoners of hope. Are you a prisoner of hope? What a term. Usually one is a prisoner of despair, but now with the king coming, with the Lord descending in our minds and our lives, we become prisoners of hope. And this Palm Sunday, you should be a prisoner of hope. We've got hope because God lives, Jesus lives, and he's in our hearts. And so for us Christians, all the beautiful pageantry of the prophet Zechariah is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And therefore we've become prisoners of hope. How is it possible? You would think that you'd be a prisoner of hope if there were 10,000 troops in front of you and 10,000 troops behind you. And, 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 and if you're held captive by a treacherous uh, uh, enemy, you'd have hope if you, you knew that your army was behind you, and the mighty air force was behind you, and if you were an American that you saw old glory and that the president and all the generals were coming to free you, then you'd have hope. But what a different image we have from the prophet Zechariah. The king in whom we find life, in whom we rejoice, is not coming on a white stallion, He's not coming in a golden chariot as the conquering generals used to do. The king of glory comes on a donkey. And he doesn't swagger. He's not arrogant. He's not puffed up. No, he comes humbly on a donkey. Isn't that a paradox? Would you have written such a story of how God would come to save us? Would you be a prisoner of hope if all you saw was a humble man on a donkey? That's the paradox of God that is against all the religions that build up this mighty image of a war and horses with swords and going to kill people. A humble man and a donkey. That's the God we see in Christ. That was the prophecy of Zechariah, but now we need to turn to the New Testament. You see, because Zechariah's prophecy for the church was fulfilled in Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. The real Palm Sunday 2,000 years ago was Jesus' Uh, public recognition that he indeed was the Messiah. There was rejoicing, there was shouting Hosanna, and Hosanna means save us now. When confronted with God, when confronted with the Holy, we stand in awe and only can say, oh Lord, 
Save us now, Hosanna, save us. When you're confronted with the king of kings, the creator of the universe. And so the people are now confronted with Jesus of Nazareth, leading the parade on a donkey. They see him in Galilee and Capernaum, the miracle worker. They see him heal the sick and make the blind to see. They saw him as a prophet and a preacher, but, but now Jesus no longer can hide his secret, but he's indeed Jesus the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one of God, Emmanuel, and now he's the God-man with us. Now we must no longer keep this mission a secret. The time is, of his ministry of three years is complete. Now Jesus is ready for the road to Jerusalem and, and the cross is before him. Now they understand that Jesus is the Messiah because that's what he says. And, and the one who's riding on a donkey is coming in the name of the Lord. Do you understand that? He's coming in the name of the Lord. And what is the Lord's name? The Lord's name is Jesus. And when meeting Jesus, I'm meeting God. This is the revelation of Palm Sunday. Not a part of God, but all of God. This is the revelation which even the children understood. It didn't come from human philosophy. It didn't come from human wisdom. It didn't come from human reason. It didn't come from human power. It didn't come from all of man. But it was a revelation. It didn't come because we were good. No, this revelation came because God said the time is fulfilled. Now is the time I'm going to reveal myself to my people and all people. And the response was one of awe. Hosanna. Save us now. Save us now. When you think back in your life, have you ever had an experience that was awesome, that was filled with awe, that, that you thought that you were being confronted with the holy, and all you could do would be silent? You're like Isaiah, holy, holy, holy. Several years ago, we were at the Grand Canyon, and if you've never been to the Grand Canyon for the first time, it, it, it really is awesome. It's awe-inspiring to see this majestic canyon created by the, the power of God, and all were silent. But suddenly we heard singing. And a group of Korean tourists were so moved by the majesty and, and grandeur of it all that they began to sing in their own language, How Great Thou Art. And it was a holy experience. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the world thy hands have made. I see the stars, I, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. That's what's happening when we're confronted with the Almighty, when we're confronted with God Almighty in Jesus Christ. Well, this must have been the same experience the disciples had. The name of the Lord God was identified with a person. And they said, who is this? What's all the stir? They said, it's Jesus of Nazareth. What a beautiful festival it must have been. The people were waving palms and shouting, Hosanna, the hymn comes in the name of the Lord. And they were excited and they were rejoicing and they were happy. But oh, how sad. With these same palm wavers, the next Sabbath were crying, crucify him, crucify him. They recognized him by waving palms. They experienced the fulfillment of the messianic hope. But the cross was still before Jesus. And they did not really understand that or grasp what the Messiah was. They didn't want a Messiah like that. They wanted a general with a sword to kill the Romans and to make Israel ruler of the world. When we look back, would we have acted any differently? Without the cross, would we have recognized the Messiah on a donkey? You know, sometimes only when looking back in our own lives and in the history of the nation, do we understand where we've been or whom we have met? Only when looking back do we now know that there was only when there was only one set of footprints that was God who was carrying us. Only when we look back and we did not get what we wanted, do we now realize it was for our own good. Sometimes we forget what happened and we need reminders to help us focus on the real thing. You know, there's a sickness called amnesia. 
where men and women sometimes for a year or more, they, they, they leave home and forget who they are and where they live and they're lost. And, and then suddenly somebody recognizes them and, and reminds them of who they are and where they came from. You know, the world today has collective amnesia. It's forgotten God. Western civilization with all of its might and all of its power in the United States, with all of our armies and all of that, we have collective amnesia. We don't know who blessed us. We don't know why we're blessed and why we came so far. Do you think it's because of all of our bombs and all of our military? The same with the world. They've forgotten Jesus' love and redemption, his sorrow, his salvation. But you see, that's why God has given us the Bible, isn't it? To remind us. And this morning, the Apostle Paul reminds us of the significance of Christ's name. His humility, his mission, and his, his modest way of living for you and me. He was a model. And Philippians 2 reminds us of the significance of the name of Jesus. Paul reminds us that God has highly exalted Jesus and bestowed on him a name which is above every name. That in the name of Jesus, not in the name of our government, not in the name of some great athlete or some political leader. No, but in the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, whether in heaven or on earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. If that's what you believe, then the question is, why are we living like we are? We began, we began by reminding ourselves of Moses', Moses question is, to what is your name? And God came to visit the great I am, and, and then through Israel's history of victory and defeat, of sin and repentance, they're, they're chastised by the prophets and brought again to their senses, and they confess that only Jehovah, only Yahweh is God, the Lord. And so the Apostle Paul reminds us on this Palm Sunday what it was all about. We are told what it means when the people are shouting, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Paul reminds us that this name of the Lord is none other than Jesus the Christ. And precisely this humble one riding on the donkey is the one to whom one day every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. Isn't that amazing? That's what we believe. That's what the Christian faith is all about. And the name of God for the Christian is none other than the God we meet in Jesus Christ. The triune God who reveals himself as one God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Creator, the Redeemer, and Sanctifier. That is the God that we worship. And it is this God whose revelatory name is Jesus that we celebrate on Palm Sunday. And this Jesus becomes the model for the Christian in every walk of life. <laughs> And we need to keep going back to that to remind ourselves again and again how Jesus modeled for us how our life should be lived. If we're followers of Jesus, then there should be three qualities of our personal and communal existence together. You as an individual, you as a member of Tremont Temple. According to Philippians 2, we have one mind, one love, one unity. And all of this should bring complete joy to the church and to the glory of the Father. One mind. The church is the body of Christ needs to be of one mind. That is, as Christians, we have one hope and one doctrine. Mind here refers to the question of our basic beliefs, our basic doctrines. You just don't believe whatever you want to believe. There are certain doctrines that we have. And you know, one of my joys of, of having been able to travel all over the world as General Secretary of the Baptist World Alliance was to meet Chinese who ate with chopsticks and, and Japanese and to meet Africans and Argentinians and Brazilians uh, and, and everybody eats in a different way and speaks a different language but you, you know what the amazing thing is? We're one in the name of Jesus Christ and this is what the Apostle Paul reminds us that we have one mind and that mind is that we belong to Jesus Christ. And then Paul goes on and says, this is the model that you have. In a similar fashion, we should have love for one another. You know, we said to the early Christians, look how they love one another. John reminds us that God is love. Listen to this. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the expiation for our sins. 
It is this love that the church is called to emanate. And that's why John reminds us, he who does not love does not know God, for God is love. That's a challenge to all of us, isn't it? Brothers and sisters, if we truly love God, then we would love one another. Many of you know that for the past five years, this church has gone through a struggle where there's been a great lack of love. But God in His mercy has begun the process of reconciliation, of bringing us together again. And now we know of God's love and our need to love one another. And let us pray that indeed we'll always seek that one love. The great Chinese scholar Lin Yu Tang at Columbia University came to Christ when he remembered that missionary who loved his people back in Beijing. And it is that love that's going to bring men and women to Christ in Boston. That when men and women come into Tremont Temple, say, look how they love one another. And then thirdly, Paul says that we have one unity. The Apostle Paul appeals for the unity of the church. If you read the early church fathers, it's unity, unity, unity. Ever since Cain killed Abel, men and women have begun struggling to find unity again. For the last, even today, we have wars and rumors of war continuing in our history. But in Jesus Christ, we have unity, unity of mind, unity of love, unity for which he prayed. Jesus said, Father, I pray that they might be one. Why? So that the world might believe. That's an evangelistic prayer. Do you realize that, that our lack of love for one another is one of the greatest hindrances to evangelism? Jesus said that they should be one. Our lack of unity hinders people from coming. I pray that they might be one so that the world might know who you are and believe. Whoever causes division and lack of unity is hindering the kingdom of God and hindering people from coming to faith. And there's going to be great judgment, Scripture says one day. And so Paul reminds us that this Jesus whose name the children and adults shouted in joy is none other than the one we meet on the cross. Even though he was God, he took upon himself a human body to dwell with us, but he emptied himself, this is the great kenosis, he emptied himself of his Godhead so that being without sin, he could die for our sins. As John the Baptist said, remember John the Baptist saw him and said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. That's who Jesus is. That's the one who is riding on a donkey, the one who takes away the sins of the world. On that first Palm Sunday, many years ago, the, the people shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Thank God that we know God's name. Thank God that we know that the name of the Lord is Jesus, the Christ. Thank God that we have a Savior. Thank God that He came and comes to forgive us our sins. Thank God that there is a name I love to hear. I love to sing its word. It sounds like music in my ears. The sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Can that be your song this morning? Thank God that this Jesus knows your name and my name. Listen to those comforting words. He knows his sheep by name. The great master, creator of the universe knows your name. He knows you. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Jesus knows your name. Do you really know Jesus' name? In Jesus the name, is Jesus the name you love to hear? On that final day when every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, will you be among those who in this life will have confessed that there is no other name in heaven or earth whereby one can be saved? Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's the name we worship. That's the name that we celebrate, that Jesus, when he left, he gave us this communion to remind us that we belong to a family that we have a name. And therefore, all who confess Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior are invited to this holy table.
In this church, we always give an invitation for those who perhaps have never confessed Christ as Lord, or for those who need prayer. And therefore, I'm asking the deacons if you would come forward now and just stand here. And maybe you need to say, you know, I know that name, but I need to confess that name to my neighbor, to my wife, to my husband, to my son, to my daughter. I need to know in my life that that is the name above every name. I call myself a Christian, but what does it mean? So as we sing this last hymn, this hymn for communion, you're invited to come and to pray with one of the deacons. Maybe you've never been baptized and you didn't join the church. Come talk to me then. Let's pray. Oh Lord Jesus, name above all names, we thank you for your love that you are indeed the Christ, the Son of the living God. And therefore we come to you this morning with joy. We confess our sins and we come for prayer. Bind us together, Lord Jesus. Amen.